Well, thank you very much. Man, it's been a great week for me. I have loved being here. And, uh, you know, I want to say, I know most of you know this, but when you go behind the scenes with all of the leadership of the church and stuff, things look even better than they do from the stage. And you can't say that about everybody. There's places that I go that people look really good on the stage, but when you get to know them, it's not so good. And your people are just better the more you know about them. And that's really, really good. So I appreciate this. I feel a part of what's happening here at Victory Life. And uh, even though I'm not a member of the church, even though I don't come here, I, I feel like I'm a part of the body and I'm excited about what God's doing here. Let me just mention some of our materials. I've got, uh, where's Pastor Lamont and Sharon? Are they? Oh, here they are. I'd like to ask them to come forward. These are our uh, pastoral relations directors. If any of you are pastors or ministers and you would like some fellowship, they're here for you. And I'm going to let them give these books away. But this one's entitled, Who Told You That You Were Naked? And I have people that all the time say, I want that book on how to be naked. <laughs> this isn't about being naked. This is a quote from Genesis 3.11 where the Lord said, who told you that you were naked? God didn't tell them. The devil didn't tell them. It was their own conscience that condemned them once they ate of the tree. This is a study in the conscience and how that it's your conscience that's really the problem. So I'm going to let Lamont give that to somebody who looks like you need help. And I'm going to be ministering on these two things this morning, but uh, here's a book, Don't Limit God. This is what Dwayne preached last night, and I tell you, our uh, lives parallel each other so much, it's nearly scary at times, but this is a great teaching, and I'm going to be talking about this morning. This morning. Don't limit God. Give that to somebody that looks like they've been limiting God. And the amazing thing is people still raise their hands after I say and this one's on the power of imagination, which there is a part in that book about imagination, but this is an amplification on that. So, man, you need a positive imagination. And this is my newest book, a 422-page book on uh, Romans. It's a verse-by-verse -verse study through Romans, and it has my footnotes from my living commentary as well as comments from times that I've taught. And it's 422 pages of just studying verse-by-verse -verse through Romans. It's entitled, Paul's Masterpiece on Grace. If Romans isn't one of your favorite books, you do not understand grace. That's a big statement, but it's absolutely true. So I'll let Sharon give that to someone. And we aren't going to take anything home with us. So whatever's left out there, y'all go help yourself and just get whatever. And we encourage people to give, but if uh, you can't give or feel like you're stretched in that area, just take whatever you want. It'll be awesome. Amen. So I want to turn over to Psalms chapter 78, verse 41. Pastor Dwayne preached this last night. I'm going to come at it from a little different direction, but everything that Dwayne said, I've dealt with these exact same things. It's, it's amazing. I don't know if Dwayne told you, but one time I took him and Sue to Cancun with us, and we went and played golf, and Dwayne was worried about his golf balls because they're those kind of neon yellow green ones. And he thought, Andrew's not going to like this. And when we got there, those are the ones that I use. <laughs> we do everything together. It's like, I don't know. It is, I've never met anybody in my life who what God has done in his life is so parallel, similar to what God has done in my life. And we didn't know each other. We've only known each other maybe 10, 12 years. But uh, it's not copying or anything. It's just God working in our lives. And I think it really traces back to the way he had that vision of the cross and seeing himself crucified. I didn't have a vision of the cross, but man, I had an experience with the Lord, March the 23rd, 1968, that did the exact same thing. So the Lord started in our lives the same way, and we've developed a lot the same way. So I want to share with you what the Lord did in my life on January the 31st, 2002, and that's what this book is about, about Don't Limit God. And all of the things that have been said this week, from going back to Wednesday night when I spoke about the body 
that we need to, instead of waiting on the ministers to do all of the ministry, they, their job is to train you up. And this project big, the vision that you've got, it's not going to be accomplished by the leadership. The leadership leads you, but you're the ones that God wants to use. And we've got to be assembled together. And every single part has to contribute and be a part of this. So I want to share with you what the Lord spoke to me January 31st, 2000. And two, and this is the second most important encounter that I've had with the Lord. And I'm, I'm going to be struggling today to uh, share this with you because since 2002, I've been meditating on this day and night. It's a part of me. And I've learned so much that there's no way I can share with you everything that God has spoken to me. And so everything that Dwayne was saying last night, I've been through those exact same things, the dread about offending people and uh, afraid to ask and just every single thing he is talking about. And I could add to that my other 17 things. Uh, there is just a multitude of things. But what I want to focus on today is talking about your imagination. This was the next step. It was a part of what God only applies to ministers, somebody who's in ministry or something like that. And the average person doesn't have vision. You ought to have a vision for your life. Every single one of you, every one of you, you know, if you aren't aiming at anything, you'll hit it every time. If you're aiming at nothing, you'll hit it every time. You do not get where God wants you to be in life without having a vision of what he wants you to accomplish. My experience, and I'm sure every person here could verify this, that if, you, if God calls you to do something, which he's called every one of us, Pastor Dwayne and I are going to do a destiny conference at our place in September sometime, and this is what we're talking about, that God's got a purpose for every one of you. Psalms 139, when you were still in your mother's womb, God had written all of your days out in a book. He doesn't just look at you and see how you developed and, oh, this person's got this talent and this talent. Maybe I could use them over here. No, before you were even born, God had your days written out. Now, he doesn't force you to do it. You've got total freedom over your life, but he had a plan for your life. He's never made a piece of junk. He's never made a failure. He's never determined for anybody to be, quote, unquote, normal by the world's standards. Every one of you ought to be exceptional. You are a unique creation of God. And unless you know what that purpose for your life is, you aren't going to get there accidentally. You know, we're, going to, we're driving back to Colorado today. And I guarantee you, we have to know where we're going. If I just got in a car and said, well, let's go this direction. And you didn't know where you were going and you just went any direction and followed the road, you'd hit a dead end. Have any of you come to a dead end? You would wind up going in the wrong direction. You don't get places just by, you know, getting in your car and going. You have to know where you're going. Your life needs to have a purpose. And so, uh, anyway, like I said, I'm going to try and say things quickly. But when the Lord touched my life in 1968, I was so excited about the Lord that instantly I just wanted to share the things that I had experienced in God with every person on the planet. And uh, over, I'd say, the next three to four years, the vision got pretty clear that God had called me to be a teacher. And, that, uh, and as I meditated on it, I really believed I was going to have a worldwide ministry that would touch people all over the world. And so I knew that in my heart, and I started moving in that direction. But from about uh, 1968 until 2002, even though I was moving in that direction, I had all of these things on the inside of me that was limiting what God could do, exactly what Pastor Dwayne was talking about last night. And uh, we had come to a place in the ministry where the ministry was growing. We had to have a new facility and so we started looking for new buildings. We were in a 14,000 square foot building and we needed extra space. And so I was traveling and Jamie was out looking for buildings while I was gone. And when I, she picked me up at the airport, 
uh, she says, I want to show you this building. And she took me by a building that was 30,000 square feet, over twice as big as what we had. And she says, this will last us the rest of our lives. And when she said that, I knew that, no, my vision is bigger than that. But you know what? I hadn't been speaking it, not even to Jamie. Jamie and I share everything. But it's like if you reach over to pet a dog, if every time you do that, it bites you, eventually you're going to quit petting that dog. And I had spoken out my vision when we were pastoring little churches of five people. My first church had five people. And the second one, man, we jumped up to about 50. And then the third one, we jumped up to 100 that was pretty good in a town of 144, but nonetheless, 100 is the largest church that I ever had. And I was speaking these things, and every time I'd say it, people would just look at you like, you are crazy. And they would criticize you, and, and, and it hurt me. It hurt my vision. It was like pouring water on a fire. And so after a while, I quit speaking my vision, even to my wife. And when she said that, about 30,000 square feet will ha hold us the rest of our life, I just, it really bothered me that I thought, man, I have not done well at communicating my vision at all. And I began, and the Lord began to use that, and there's other things. Again, I could spend the whole service talking about it, but on January the 31st, 2002, all of these things came together when I read this verse in Psalms chapter 78 and verse 41. Let me back up to verse 40. And it says, How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And Dwayne talked about this last night. I pray if you missed any of that, please get what he said because it's all necessary. But it just dawned on me that I knew what God's will for my life was. And I was heading in that direction, but at a snail's pace. And I realized that the, at the pace I was moving, I'd have to live four or five hundred years to fulfill the vision that he had put in my heart. And I just realized, God, something's wrong. What's happening? And the Lord used this verse to tell me I was limiting him. And there was many ways, those things that Dwayne talked about, every one of them, I, I typically would preach on that. But let me just focus that because of my fear of rejection, fear of being criticized, another thing Dwayne didn't mention, but he probably had to deal with too, for the first time in our life, it, it, we'd been in ministry 34 years, and for the first time in our life, we were making it and had some money in the bank. I mean, prior to that time, I was turned over to collection agencies often. It looked like we were going to fail all of the time. Every day, it was like we had to have a miracle to eat. And for the first time in our life, we were succeeding, and, and it was working, and we were secure. And to step out and speed up was a huge risk, fear of failure, uh, there was a temptation just to stay where we are and enjoy it because things were working for the first time. And so I had to deal with all of that. But anyway, once the Lord finally showed me that my small thinking was limiting what he could do, I called my staff together on February the 11th, 2002. We had, a, uh, I think it was 20 or 20 or something people like that, maybe 18 or 20 people. And I called them together. And I said, I don't know how long it takes to change the image on the inside. I'm going to explain this more in just a second. But I said, I don't know how long it takes to change the image that you have on the inside. I don't know if it takes a day, a week, a month, a year. But I said, I am going to change the image on the inside. I am going to do what God told me to do. And I told them that. And did you know that on, in two days' time, I had been trying to go on one of the major networks, television networks in the U.S. for two years. Marcus and Joni Lamb were friends of mine. I'd been on Daystar many times as a guest, and I'd tried to buy airtime from them. And every time I uh, contacted them, they would give me a price that was more than they charged anybody else. I couldn't understand it. 
And for two years, we had tried to go on that television network, and nothing worked. Within two days of me making that statement and making some of the adjustments I'm going to be talking about today, I got a letter from Marcus Lamb, and he says, why aren't you on Daystar? He says, you just forget the money. You send us a tape. We will start you on Monday, and I guarantee you, we will give you a deal that you can't refuse. And so something I'd been trying for two years, within two days, just came to pass. And for those of you that are challenged mathematically, January 2001, uh, 2 was just about, what, four or five months after September the 11th happened, and we were under uh, attack. And during that period of time, Media Ministries, I had just started on television January the 3rd, 2000. Media Ministries, many of them either just tanked and totally went off or they struggled. I could name names right now of some of the ministries that you know of, and they struggled because people weren't watching their program. Everybody was glued to the television set wondering what's going to happen in the nation. And out of sight, out of mind. And most media ministries really went down after January, I mean, after September the 11th. And so when the Lord spoke to me, it was just a few months after that. And without me telling anybody, it took me about two months to write a letter, send a letter out to our partners about what God had spoken to me. But before I even told anybody, our finances doubled. And things began to happen, and people started coming to me. And the way I look at it is it's like God had a plan for my life, and he was flowing all of his anointing and provision and everything that I needed to accomplish that plan. But my small thinking had created a dam that just kept all of this stuff there. And when I changed my thinking, I mean, boom, like this, opportunities came, money came, people came. And I'm going to refrain from telling you exact figures. I'd love to do it, but people use it against me. But anyway, since that time, we have increased over 40 times what we were. It is phenomenal what God has done, the number of people and the things that are happening. And I mean... I had I was in Australia and I was sitting there looking at these mountains and just praising God and the Lord showed me a vision not I didn't see it but just this is the thought that came to me I saw Jamie and me pushing this huge boulder <laughs> that was bigger than us a round boulder up a hill and we spent 34 years pushing that boulder up a hill. And I mean, if we would have stopped at any second, that thing would have rolled back over us and smushed us. And it was just effort and effort. And there was no let up. There was no ease. And all of a sudden, we topped the hill and we were pushing this boulder on a flat space. That's where we were from January of 2000 to January 2002. For two years, it had been relatively easy. And we could actually rest every once in a while. And then he showed me that we had gone past that flat spot. Now we were going down the downside and that boulder was rolling and I was having to run to keep up with it. And that's the way that our ministry was. For 34 years, it was nothing but a strain. And then all of a sudden for two years, we just had blessing and things were relatively easy. And now things are going so fast that I can't even keep up with everything God's doing. So anyway, that's a little testimony about what the Lord showed me work. But I want to share with you about how the Lord spoke to me about my imagination. And I've got an entire series on this, and so I'm saying some things real quickly. But first of all, let me just say that when you use the word imagination, most people look at that as fantasy. Fantasy is part of your imagination, but that's not what I'm talking about. Fantasy is seeing something that isn't real like a, a mouse that talks <laughs> or, you know, all of the Disney stuff. That's fantasy. But imagination is something that God created you with. Matter of fact, if I had time, I wished I had time to go through all of this, but I could show you in the 11th chapter of Genesis that God was challenged by our imagination. He came down and he says, now nothing that they have imagined will be restrained from them. If you can imagine it, you can do it. 
I'm going to say some things really quickly. I encourage you to please go study this stuff out. I'm sure Dwayne can teach you. He probably already has taught you on a lot of these things. But your imagination is your spiritual womb. It says that in um, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. The word mind there is the Hebrew word Y-E-T-S-E-R, and the only definition of that word in the Strong's Concordance is conception. The word that was translated mind, is trans- it means conception, and that same word was translated imagine four or five times in the Old Testament. Your imagination is your spiritual womb. And in the same way as you can't conceive a child without conceiving in your womb. I'm going to leave, uh, you know, Pastor Jacob to teach you about this, but the stork doesn't bring children. Uh, You don't get pregnant by standing next to somebody who's pregnant and it you know, anyway, he'll, he'll explain all that to you. But you have to conceive a child. And, and you have to conceive a miracle. You have to conceive God's will. And the part of you that conceives is mind. And it was also translated imagination. That's your spiritual womb. And if you can't see it on the inside, you'll never see it on the outside. And the sad fact is most people think imagination is childish, it's fantasy, we're adults, we can't, you know, we're going to deal in reality. You need to constantly be imagining, seeing things. Again, if I had time, I could go through Psalms chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, in the law doth he meditate day and night. Did you know that that word for meditate in Psalms 1-2 is the exact same word in Psalms 2-1 that says, why do the heathen imagine a vain thing? You can't meditate without your imagination. Your imagination is just your ability to see something in your heart that you can't see with your eyes. And did you know right now, wherever you parked today, did you know you use your imagination to get find your car right now every one of you can tell me you may not remember exactly if it's the second or third in from the uh you know the row but you know what part of the parking lot you parked in that's your imagination you can see it if i was to ask you how many doors do you have in your house and just to simplify it i could say how many outside doors do you have in your house most of you haven't really sat down and counted that but did you know you could tell me because you can look at it that's your imagination. Jamie and I went over in England, and we were going to buy some water, and we went into a store. And did you know in England, they, they organize everything differently than we do here. So we went into a grocery store expecting things to be organized the way they are here. It took us 10 minutes to find the water because we were expecting it. We saw it being over here, and it was someplace else. That's your imagination. If I asked you how you get from here, out to the highway. Did you know you, go, you say, well, you go out here and you turn left or right and you, you go down to this stoplight and you'll turn. You can't see those things right now, but you can see it. That's your imagination. You can't function without an imagination. You can't remember anything without an imagination. So anyway, all of that's to say that you have an imagination and it's not childish. You use it every day. But it says in Romans 1.21 that if you don't really glorify God and be thankful and seek him, your imagination becomes vain. And this is what's happened to most of us. Life beats a positive imagination out of most people. Most people at one time had dreams and visions of doing something with their life. But then you have to make a living and you try some things. And if you fail and if you've been through a divorce or if you had been fired from something, most people let that just kill their imagination. This is what JB talked about on Thursday night, that teacher that came by and says, you know, this doesn't work for people like you. It squelched his imagination, his dream, his vision. And so anyway, your, your imagination is where you conceive things. If you can't conceive it, you can't give birth to it. And so you have to pray that somebody else comes along and gives you your miracle. You live 
Uh, you have to have a surrogate person to per- give birth to your imagination. That's not the way that God intended it to be. Real quickly, let me give you this story that I heard on a tape one time about a woman, a pastor's wife who had real poor eyesight. She was nearly legally blind and her glasses were real thick and she had a healing evangelist coming to the church and she didn't want him to pray for her because she had been prayed for many times and it just discouraged her because nothing ever happened. It never changed. So she tried to avoid him. And the last night of the meeting, he just cornered her and he says, I am going to pray for you. So he made her take her glasses off and then he laid hands on her and prayed for her healing. And then he says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes. And when she started to open her eyes, he said, shut your eyes. And she shut her eyes thinking, what's this about? So the second time he says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he said, shut your eyes. And she was thinking, how can I tell if I can see if I don't open my eyes? And so the third time he says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he says, I didn't tell you to open your eyes. You have to see yourself seeing in your heart before you'll see yourself seeing with your eyes. And she finally understood what he was talking about. And so she kept her eyes closed, prayed in tongues for a while. And then she says, I've got it. I can see myself seeing. And he says, now open your eyes. And she opened her eyes and her eyes were healed. This is where... This is where many of us are missing it. We know that God wants us well, and so we pray and say, oh, God, heal me. But have you seen yourself well? Many of you see yourself sick. You talk sick. You plan sick. Many of you pray for prosperity, but you see yourself poor. You talk poor. You think poor. You buy the cheapest anything. And the thing wears out twice as fast as something else. You'd have actually saved money if you'd have bought something of higher quality, but you're just cheap. You serve El Cheapo instead of El Shaddai. And you know what? You're praying for prosperity, but you're shooting yourself in the foot. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. Your life is, (laughs) some of you aren't going to like this. But your life is the way you see it being. And some of you, oh, that's not so. I'm praying for prosperity. I'm praying for healing. I'm praying. You may be praying for it. You may desire it. You may want it. But your life is the way you see it being. As you think in your heart, so are you. If your life is a mess, I'm not saying that you wanted that. I'm not saying that you prayed for it, but... Life has come against you. Satan has attacked you. We live in a fallen world, and there's just bad things that happen. And you have let circumstances and things dictate to you, and you have accepted less than God's best. God's never made a single one of you for failure, ever. There is no such thing. Every one of you are designed by God for something awesome. Not everyone is going to be doing what, you know, those of us that are in ministry are doing, but every one of you, it's awesome. God has a tremendous plan. But most people let circumstances control them. And they're like a pinball that you just pull back the lever and launch that thing. And then it just bounces off. It depends. You try this. And if that doesn't work, you go over here and it just... Whatever will be, will be. You just are like water. You seek the lowest level. I'm not saying these things to hurt anybody. I'm saying it to open up our eyes that what we are calling normal is abnormal in God's sight. God made you for something awesome. Your life ought to be absolutely awesome. You do not have to be a preacher. You do not have to be somebody that the world calls important. Every one of you have gifts and talents that if you were to reach your full potential, it would amaze you and everybody around you. And yet the average person, average person lives in such a way that if you were to die, nobody would miss you. I'm not saying that to hurt anybody, but I mean, when you die, somebody ought to miss you. Your life should have made a difference. It ought to be that, man, who's going to take this person's place? 
If you aren't living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. God made you to do something significant. So anyway, all of this, the things that I'm sharing with you, God showed me that I wasn't pushing ahead and fulfilling his thing. And I had to start seeing what, God, what I knew God's will for my life was. I had to start seeing it come to pass. And just as is happening here with this church, as your vision increases, well, then that means that everything else, the facilities that it takes to accommodate that increases. Our Bible school was growing, and at the time the Lord spoke all this to me, we were in a place that could only handle 100 people, and I knew that we were going to need much more space. And so anyway, long story, but I bought, I went from 14,000 square feet to 110,000 square feet, which everybody around me thought, you're absolutely crazy. This is nearly 10 times what you've got. Did you know now we have over 770,000 square feet and I've got another million square feet that I'm in the process of building. That's how much we've increased. But when we moved into this 110,000 square feet, we bought a building for $3.2 million. I took out a loan on that. And then I was waiting. I had to have another $3.2 million to renovate it. And um, I tried for nine months to get uh, a loan. And this was during that same period of time. And right at the time that the Lord told me I was limiting him, the uh, realist, uh, the banker came back. And after nine months, he says, you know, we need a new appraisal. Let's just start the whole thing over again. <laughs> and I thought, man, all, all I could see was another nine months of him saying next week, next week. And so I said, no, I'm going to pray about this. And anyway, long story, but the Lord told me to do it debt free. Now we had already taken out a loan for the first 3.2 million, but this 3.2 million at the rate we were receiving money at that time, I sat down and figured it out. I'd have been over 120 years old by the time I got $3.2 million. That's how little we were having our cash flow come in. And I just knew that that wasn't going to work. So, but anyway, the Lord told me to do that. So I committed to it. And I said, I don't care if they come to me tomorrow and tell me that I'm approved for the loan. I'm not going to take it. God is going to do it debt free. Now, see, this was, I saw it and this was stretching myself. And these things that I'm talking about, I'm talking about what's happened to me, but this same thing applies to this whole church group, not only in this location, but in every location. God is stretching you. So that you can accommodate more, lengthening your cords, strengthening your stakes so that you can accommodate more people and make a greater impact. And so anyway, I told him, I said, I won't take it. And the next day, Wells Fargo came back and said, you don't need 3.2. We've approved you for $4 million. And you know what? I turned them down. I said, you're a day late. <laughs> and I turned them down. And did you know in 14 months, we got that $3.2 million moved into that facility debt free. But when I made that decision, it didn't just happen instantly. And you know what I did? I had my builder. We had this huge 110,000 square foot uh, warehouse and we had gutted it and we had actually dug the trenches for the plumbing and things like that. So we had holes dug in the concrete where the plumbing would go and dirt piled up and stuff like this. And I had my builder go in there and put duct tape on the floor of where every wall was. We had already designed the plans and I had them put down where every wall was, where every door was and everything. And I would spend anywhere from one to three, four hours a day at night after all of the staff was gone. And I would just walk through that building, praying in tongues and, and asking God to help me to see this, quickening my imagination. And did you know, I never stepped over the duct tape. I would walk down the hall and they, I had them put, you know, the duct tape at an angle where a door was. And I would act like I was opening the door and I'd walk in and I'd look at this office and see, is this the way I want it to be? I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. Not to use your imagination. God gave it to us. I was conceiving something. 
And I walked into every room. I put buckets, five-gallon buckets on the floor with plywood across them. And I stood on that and acted like there was people in there. And I preached entire messages to people. And I saw that place filled. And again, some people think that's strange. This is just using your imagination. And I guarantee you, I got spiritually pregnant. And I knew I had it. You know, when a woman first gets pregnant, she doesn't even know she's pregnant. It takes a while for her to recognize it. But then she knows she's pregnant when nobody else can tell. But then after a while, everybody can tell she's pregnant. And did you know there was a time that I was, I was pregnant with this vision and nobody else could see it. Everybody thought, you are absolutely crazy to turn down the money that you need to do this. And you just shot yourself in the foot. Nothing's going to work. But I knew I had it. And then people could see after a while, they began to start being encouraged by me. They, they believed because I believed. And then eventually... It came to pass. Everybody could see it. And then we gave birth. And did you know when we we had that building completed and we had the dedication service, I'm not a real emotional person as far as out. Inside, I have all kinds of emotion. I just don't show a tremendous amount of emotion. I'm, you know, Dwayne Sheriff is me with personality. He said that the other (laughs) night. So anyway, I just don't show a lot of emotion. And we were having the dedication service for this thing. And a woman came up and she says, aren't you excited? But because I wasn't shouting or running or doing something, she thought I wasn't excited. And I said, well, sure, I'm excited. She says, well, you don't act excited. And I said, I was excited a year ago when I conceived it. I said, I have walked through this place hour upon hour upon hour rejoicing and praising God for it. And when I see it with my eyes, That isn't as exciting to me as the conception. It's like giving birth isn't near as much fun as conceiving. (laughs) I'll let Jacob explain that one. (laughs) But I like the conception part much more than the birth part. And, you know, when we moved into that building, I was already, I told him at the dedication, I said, give me five years and we'll be out of here into another place. And did you know now we've got 700 and something thousand square feet and I already have over a hundred million dollars worth of buildings in my heart and we are already developing plans for them. I've got it. That's to me exciting. Vision is more exciting than seeing it. Paul said that we walk by faith and not by sight. Sadly, most Christians walk by sight and not by faith. Did you know faith is, involves your imagination? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. You know what hope is? It's a positive imagination. It says over in Romans chapter 8 that if you hope for that which you see, then it's not hope anymore. Hope is always future. It's seeing something that you can't see. It's using your imagination, not fantasy, not you just dreaming up your own stuff, but those God-given dreams that God puts in your heart, you have to see them. And most, I believe every one of us were given an imagination. It is a, like I said, you can't find your car. You can't go to the grocery store. You couldn't get home without your imagination. But most of us have let our imagination become vain. We've let it atrophy. Most people only see negative things. If the doctor says you're going to die, we can see that. If you have the same sickness that you saw somebody else die with, you immediately see yourself going through those things. Most people's imagination works against them instead of for them. But you can turn it around and have your imagination. You can see yourself healed. You can see yourself doing what God said you could do. But I can guarantee you, you're going to have to fight against the devil, against people, against circumstances, against finances, against just a lot of things in order to see with your heart. But if you can't see it on the inside, then you limit what God can do. You limit him through your small imagination. 
And I tell you, since that time, it is absolutely phenomenal what God has done in our life. Did you know back in 2001, we received one-fourth as many calls in all of the year of 2001, one-fourth as many calls as we receive in a month now. We're over 40 times larger in income, in ministry to people. We can be seen anywhere on the planet on local television. And of course, through the internet, you can do other things. But I mean, it is phenomenal what God has done. When the Lord spoke all these things to me, we covered 2% of the U.S. population. Now we cover about 4 billion people on, in the, on the planet. And that's just English speaking. We've got seven languages that all of the programs are translated into. And all of these things came by taking the limit off of God. And I'm not saying any of these things for my benefit, but I'm just trying to encourage you that God has a plan for every one of you, and it's better than you think. Some people think, well, you know, I don't want to tax God. I don't want to dream too big. It's not like God is saying, Andrew, don't encourage him too much. These people might believe for something really big. I'm not sure I can do it. I can guarantee you that's not what God's doing. God's telling me to go for it, stir you up, and let you believe for big stuff. There's not a one of us that has tapped God out. I had a man come for prayer one time, and he says, I need prayer for my neck. It is really giving me pain. And he says, would you please pray for my neck? And before I could pray for him, he says, I've also got pain down my spine. I've got pain in my hip. I've got sciatica. I've got neuropathy. And he names stuff from head to toe. And then he says, but the neck is the really bad thing. If I could just get that, I could live with the rest. And I looked at him and I said, well, I understand. If we ask God to heal all of those things all at once, the lights in heaven might dim. I'm not sure God <laughs> has enough power to do that. Let's not ask God for something that might wear him out. <laughs> and this guy just looked at me and he says, that was really dumb. What? And I said, it was real dumb. It was stupid. <laughs> and I prayed for him and he got healed from head to toe. But sometimes... We think, man, I got to have $21.5 million. God, am I thinking too big? God just laughs at this. <laughs> you know, again, I, I hope nobody misunderstands why I say things. I'm trying to encourage you that Jamie and I were so poor, we couldn't pay attention. We went without food for weeks at a time. We had collection agencies come against us. And did you know that since the Lord has spoken to me 2002, I've had over $650 million come through my hands in 19 years. And that's just a fraction of what I'm going to have. I'll have way over a billion dollars before too long. And I guarantee you, it is not anything in the natural. Most of you listening to me know it's not my dynamic personality that made this happen. <laughs> but I'm telling you, if you can conceive it on the inside, you can see it on the outside. And this is where so many of us are missing it. We just sit there and downplay our vision and we listen to the critics that tell us you can't do it. Don't let somebody tell, that's telling me I can't do it stand in the way of those who are doing it. You've got to get, you got to get past people speaking against you. Dwayne talked about that, Jer, uh, John 5, 44. How can you believe which receive honor one from another and seek not the honor that comes from God alone? I guarantee you, if you receive this message today and start thinking big, I can guarantee you some of your very best friends and your family will come out against you big time because your family is either going to be inspired and say, well, man, if you can do it, I can do it. But that's not the normal response. The normal response is to think, who do you think you are? I wiped your bottom when you were a little baby and here you are talking about doing something big and your family will start tearing you down in order to justify their ineffectiveness. 
Because if it'll work for you, well, then they have no excuse. So the easier thing to do is to just criticize you and speak against you. My brother came out against me and praise God over a period of time, he's come around and he's now supportive of me and we're great friends, my sister, my mother, everybody. But you know what? They all, after a while, they saw it and they, they've come around. But you have to get to a place to where Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. What has God told you to do? What are the dreams in your heart? You need to make sure it's not your dreams, not something that you hatched up. You want to be Britney Spears. Is that a person? I'm, 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 I'm so out of this culture. I think that that's right, isn't it? Isn't there a Britney Spears? Yes. But some of you want to be a singer or a movie star or something like that. And is that what God wants for you? You need to make sure that your life is committed to God. But some of you have dreams and you know that God has more for you. I would imagine that the average person sitting in this auditorium, even though you may be enjoying your salvation and your life may be good and you may have a nice house and car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you're just thinking, is this all there is? The average person is feeling like, God, isn't there more to life than getting up and going to work, coming home and watching television, going to bed and then repeating it all over again? The average person knows that they are missing out, that there's got to be more to life than what they're experiencing. And yet they look around and everybody else is as miserable as they are. Everybody else is as poor as they are, as defeated as they are. And they just think, well, this is the way life is. I'm telling you what, that's not God's kind of living. God has a plan for you that when you wake up in the morning, it ought to be like, oh, Jesus, I'm excited about today. How are we going to see things come to pass today? And if that's not your attitude, I'm saying this in love, but you're, you're aiming too low. You're shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. You need to start dreaming. You need to see big things. The leadership here is dreaming. I believe I bear witness with what they're saying. And you're a part of it. And if you would allow God, he would prosper you and help you to be your part and to bring in this. And I don't know if they're going to do things debt free. You don't have to do. I'm not saying that. But it, there's no reason with as many people as they have that they shouldn't pay for this thing debt free. You can do it. But every one of you is going to have to start letting what God has put in your heart come to pass. All right, so I'm through teaching. I've got a lot more to say. But now I'm stepping over into the ministry of a prophet. I hadn't got time to explain this, but the Lord called me to be a prophet in 2015 and separated me unto that. Anybody can prophesy and say encouraging things. It says you can all prophesy one by one. But this isn't a, what I call a simple prophecy. This is the ministry of a prophet. I would not come into a church and give direction without asking. And I asked Dwayne and Sue last night. But the Lord spoke this to me this week, and I think he wanted me to say this publicly, that God showed me that Dwayne Sheriff Ministries is about to explode in ways that they have never, ever seen before. It is going to just take off. And here's the vision that the Lord showed me that Dwayne has been yoked together with Victory Life Church. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's what God wanted. I mean, Dwayne Sheriff Ministries and Victory Life have been yoked together and moving along in tandem. And I'm not saying that the connection is broken, but I see that it's time for Dwayne Sheriff Ministries to go ahead. What God has put in Dwayne is much, much, much bigger than what Victory Life churches and network of churches can accommodate. He's got a word that very few people in this world have. And God, I see Dwayne now accelerating and going ahead, and he's still connected. I don't know how this is going to work. I'm sure that God will lead them. But he is going to start reaching people 
beyond just the church. He's done this to a degree, but it's going to explode. And he's not disconnected from the church. He has the Apostle over this will always be here. I don't, they'll work all the details out. But it is going to funnel people and money into the Victory Life churches. It's going to expose people that have never heard of Dwayne Sheriff. And they are going to hear of him. And his ministry is going to start changing lives. The number of churches will increase. The revenue will increase. But I'm saying this as a prophet of the Lord that this is happening and it's happening quickly. And I just felt like that you as the family here that have been a part of this and supporting Dwayne and Sue for decades, that you needed to know this, but I really believe that this is God and you are going to see some awesome, awesome things happen. So I say that in the name of the Lord, and I know that the leadership here will apply that in a correct way. So I want to ask you today, and I, I, hopefully every person in here received what I have to say. And so I don't think I can have the prayer team come down here and just pray with you. But if you, let me say it this way. Some of you in here are believing God and you may not have arrived, but you've left and you're moving in that direction. And even though things aren't complete and there's, there's growth for every one of us, you know you're on the path. I don't want you to respond. But there are some of you in here today that, man, this is just, it hit you like it hit me back in 2002, that you're limiting God. God's got big things in store for you, and you are just stopping his plans in your life by your small thinking. And if you would humble yourself and say, man, I'm guilty and I want God to speak to me and reveal this plan and I want to start dreaming big and I, I don't want to leave any gas in my tank when it's my turn to go. I want to have used up everything that God's got me. I'm not there, but today I'm making a commitment to do that. If that's you, I want you to stand right where you are and I'm going to pray for you and I believe that God is going to rekindle this imagination and his will for you and that this is going to change you. You know, if you responded the way I presented it and the only those who already are moving in that direction and, and, and have embraced what I'm talking about are sitting and the ones who are standing are ones that saying, man, I've let my vision go and I need it rekindled. If you've responded properly, this shows us... Mm -hmm.